Hey everyone, this is the first Marco Lab episode. Quick intro, I am Suman Siva, CEO and co-founder of Marco. We are an experiences company um, that basically finds uh, amazing hosts, amazing creators, um, and allows companies uh, and teams to book them and enjoy those experiences. And so we're really passionate about a couple of things. One of them is this notion of the creator economy, which is this phrase coined by uh, an investor as well as a creator named Lee Jin. Uh, and people talk about how we're in the age of creators uh, with you know platforms like Clubhouse and Patreon uh, and the democratization of kind of access to really interesting people who are passionate about craft. So like, what is even... A creator mean they come in to me like all shapes and sizes it can be someone who is pursuing their passion building something from scratch and that could be anything from a blog to an ice cream company to a food company to uh in julia's case a seaweed company um and so for me it's been super refreshing coming from a finance background and being on the other side of the table where i meet a bunch of entrepreneurs who are doing interesting things um and give them capital to transitioning to the other side of the table and being on the more creative side. So kind of doing my best to be a creator while creating Marco, uh, which has been super inspiration, inspirational, but really the most amazing thing is, uh, and energizing is talking to other creators and kind of like convincing them to join our platform. Uh, and the, what we're doing here is we've heard so many interesting stories from creators and we're like, well, we should probably share this with people because it's super interesting and I would feel selfish if we just kind of kept that knowledge uh, to ourselves. And so what we're trying to achieve with Marco Labs is one, tell the story of these creators um, and share why their experiences are important, uh, kind of what they're passionate about, why they do what they do, um, and what does being a creator mean to them? What does kind of uh, building a community around what they're passionate about mean to them? So that's kind of what we're here for and super excited to talk to Julia because not only is she building her own company, but also she's helping out with Marco. So there's like a dual purpose here. So with that, I'd love to just, I mean, I know you, Julia, but just for the audience, kind of who are you? What's your background? You're a designer, you're an entrepreneur, you're a lot of things. Uh, and then what, like, we can talk about Sway in a second, but just like, who is, who is Julia? You know? Who is she? I don't know. Uh, let's, let's dive in. Um, important to note up at the top that you're spending a valuable hour of your birthday to talk about seaweed. So I appreciate that a lot. Um, like nothing more, you know? Yeah. Um, I'm a designer and and um, specifically a packaging and brand designer by trade. I've spent um, a good chunk of my life building uh, design systems for consumer goods companies and design studios and uh, technology companies, really trying to bring delight to places that need it um, and also try to bring a little bit of empathy to the world. So that's how most of my design decisions have been led. And that comes from my upbringing. Um, I was raised in Carmel, California, which is a couple hours south from where I am right now. Uh, spent a lot of time in the forest, a lot of time in the ocean. Um, really the appreciate ocean. nature. Yes, in the ocean. In the ocean, wow. <laughs> She's a dolphin as well. Um, a lot of time in tide pools, um, <laughs> a lot of time hiking. Um, so... Yeah, I, uh, the the reason that I'm here talking to you today and, and the reason we'll get into some of what we're building at Sway is just that I've been an environmentalist and sort of an amateur naturalist my whole life. And when that identity came into um, came into odds with my with my profession, that's how Sway was born and, and what we're building at Sway was born. Amazing. Um, and so I, I will admit when I first so my co-founder, Nick, who's actually sitting kind of right over there. Uh, I remember he was like, oh, I know this person named Julia. She's super talented. And I went and I like creeped online and I watched the, I watched the whole thing, the 45 minute <laughs> video of you talking about Sway and why you started it and that kind of thing. Uh, so Sway is, you know, a business that is replacing single use plastics. It's born out of kind of passion, um, your passion. I'd love to hear kind of the story of like how you created it. I know that there's like this epic road trip that you, <laughs> you did with, with your business partner and we can talk about your business partner who happens to be your significant other, but like, how did you get started? Um, and how did, you know, where are you right now? I guess. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, in, so in my role as a designer and, and building packaging systems for big companies, oftentimes the, the challenge is that you want something that looks absolutely gorgeous. That's completely affordable, readily available, easy to, to use. 
um, and the environmental or social impact of the material is pushed to the side. And someone in my position, and I've had so many conversations with my peers in this space, um, really we struggle to find materials that line up uh, in terms of all those values in addition to, to um, not harming the planet. Um, and when you look at the landscape of packaging that's available right now, um, there's a lot of misinformation and greenwashing and, and distrust. You got, you know, like stuff made from corn and stuff made from bacteria and 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 stuff made from sugarcane, and you don't know what to trust. So I really enjoyed uh, the diving in deep into all of these materials, understanding their deficits, diving into reusable systems, into um, package-free solutions, uh, talked with heads of packaging and procurement at Target and and um, Unilever and all sorts of big brands to see what they were doing and learned that really what we need to adopt in order to inform radical change is um, regenerative materials. So materials that uh, aren't just um, slightly better or sustaining things the way that they are, but are actually improving and, and bringing extra value at every step of the value chain. So you just mentioned regenerative materials, right? To, to, to the, the non-educated, what, is, what does that mean? <laughs> Uh, like what is what is a regenerative material? How are you creating them? It is not a, a lack of education. It's a completely new term, and it's a completely new wave of materials that's coming. So there's sort of this, um, you know, we're seeing a revolution around energy and the way that we grow our food and the way that we dress ourselves and the way we build our homes. All of these sorts of sustainable revolutions are happening right now, but it's happening in packaging as well. So we at Sway have coined this term, regenerative materials benevolent materials, basically um, stuff that does more for the planet than it takes. Um, so some great examples of regenerative materials are uh, derived from mycelium, which is mushrooms. There's an amazing uh, wave of mushroom-based packaging that essentially grows by itself, requires very little input, and composts back into healthy soil. Uh, another example is using uh, agricultural waste. Beer waste is actually a great input for different types of packaging. You can use it to replace uh, flexible films and, and even paper. Um, another example would be uh, seaweed. So that's how I really landed on seaweed as being this game-changing input because when you cultivate seaweed, uh, you're sequestering an insane amount of carbon, like 20 times more carbon than trees. Uh, it grows 20 to 30 times faster than other bio-based inputs for packaging like corn or sugar cane. You don't need land to grow it. You don't need fresh water or fertilizer or pesticides or anything really. You just need healthy ocean water and it grows. So that's the definition of a regenerative material. It's something that's more just, regenerative than that. <laughs> it's just, yeah, it's, it's, it wants to grow and it's growing quickly. Um, and it's also providing ecological services. It's sequestering carbon, mitigating ocean acidity, and providing work and opportunities to coastal communities that have been affected by overfishing. Amazing. So speaking of communities, uh, I've seen you know the imagery and videos of this epic kind of journey that you and Matt uh, kind of took uh, down the coast. Uh, I'd love to hear share a little bit about that because I my impression is you met a bunch of communities you talked to these people who are growing seaweed not only in California but all the way down in South America right yeah and uh, Suman, why weren't you on that trip that would have been I should have been so I, I think it's right yeah <laughs> you could have yeah. cooked us breakfast every morning and helped that us is pack true. the tent <laughs> yeah that would be very useful yeah um we decided that my, my co-founder, Matt, and I, who is also my significant other, as you mentioned, uh, we really wanted to understand seaweed cultivation at a micro level and get in the water with farmers and understand, you know, are the rumors true or is this all just, you know, some hype coming from the sustainable community? So we uh, packed up the truck and we drove from San Francisco all the way down to Peru. 
uh, visiting seaweed farms and farmers and biomaterial innovators and coastal communities that really, really benefit from uh, new economies. And the blue economy is this rapidly expanding space where we're going to see a lot of investment soon, um, not just in seaweed, but in different types of aquaculture, in offshore wind. Um, and the more work opportunities that we can bring to these communities, the better, because right now there's a huge problem with, with overfishing. So seaweed specifically is a great alternative to fishing and it lasts all year long. Uh, and you can use seaweed for all different kinds of things like, uh, food, and uh, you can mix yes. it into to beauty products to make it thicker. Uh, you can turn it into a biofuel and you can also use it to make bioplastics. Um, so we made this epic trip. We traveled through all of Central America uh, from, you know, and through Colombia, Ecuador and Peru, and then COVID hit. So we, we were sent back. Yes, you'll have to continue that uh, trip. My understanding because you still have a van parked in where Peru yes. or yes, the, the, the truck is parked in at a friend's house in Lima. And the ultimate goal is to get all the way down to the very tip, the southernmost tip of South America. Uh, there's a ton of seaweed that grows in Chile and we really want to see it. So eventually we will finish that trip. So I, it sounds like I can still join for the second half of that trip. You can't. So we're not yeah. all is not lost. Maybe come uh, on a motorcycle because that would be fun. We could do little I'd side to, yeah. side trips. Yeah, we can put Chris in, you know, those like carriages. Next <laughs> yes. to we'll put Chris in there. Uh, That'd be adorable. It would. So, so okay, you're starting to see like this amazing seaweed company that's extremely mission driven. Uh, and in my mind, you're a creator, right? So what what does that mean to you, right? Like what, what does being kind of a founder, creating something from scratch mean to you? Like what is your creative outlet? How do you find inspiration for it? Yeah, I mean... So I didn't expect to find myself in a founder or a CEO position. I'm trained to be a designer and really the, um, the biggest adaptation that's happened over the past couple of years is realizing that designers are, and creators in general, are especially equipped to solve large problems because they can make the impossible visible for others. So the way that I look at my role in trying to tackle a problem that's so large that it literally affects every person on earth. The plastic problem is enormous. Um, uh, it's, I, I really try to look at it as, as a design challenge and how can we design a system that is so visible to people and so exciting and beautiful that of course they're going to want to partake in it. And that's actually why I've been able to grow my team with no funding. <laughs> so, yeah. like, you know, we're raising our first round right now, but up until this point, we've been entirely self-funded and my entire team of 10 people has wanted to be a part of this company because they believe in, in the future and then basically the, the picture that, I, that I've painted for them. Yeah. I mean, I certainly believe in it, uh, as you know, but in terms of the enormity of the problem, right? Like, why should we care? I mean, we kind of all intuitively know, I just got like a bunch of Amazon packages. <laughs> sitting here, one of which was this, this microphone, yeah. but like how big of a problem is it? Is yeah. I mean, so there are all sorts of reasons to care about the plastic problem. And I think that a lot of them are very tiring and people get fatigued and don't want to talk about it. So as succinctly as possible, I can say we're specifically focused on the materials, the thin film plastics that are impossible to recycle that can't be replaced with um, reusable solutions. And that specifically is poly bags, like the ones that you got in the mail, um, poly mailers, like the Amazon mailer that you get. Yeah, I'm sitting um, right here. Pouches. Yeah, that's yeah. a great example. Um, you know, air pillows, like this thing, super mm -hmm. annoying, super pervasive. And then ultimately, uh, more complex packaging, like uh, a Snickers bar wrapper or a Cliff wrapper or something like that. So really these annoying, sneaky plastics that actually make up a huge portion of the waste that's produced every year. 46% of all plastic waste that ends up in the ocean is one of these thin film plastics. And we produce 160 million tons of them every wow. single year. Um, so the reason that you should care is there's a lot of this material. It usually has a lifespan of about 12 seconds. 
Uh, it can't be recycled, which means that it floats out of landfills into the ocean, but it also yep. floats into cities and it clogs up sewers. And the average person eats literally a credit card worth of plastic every single week um, through wow. microplastics that make their way into the food and the air that we breathe. So yeah, there's a lot of reasons to care, but it's a health issue. It's not just an ocean issue, it's everywhere. It'd be great if instead we could redesign this material to restore and replenish the planet instead. So one thing that we think a lot about at Marco, which you obviously know through working at Marco, is this like concept of community, right? And I think communities can show up in different ways. For us, it's, you know, the community of creators and hosts, it's the community of people at work. Um, I, I know that you are kind of very plugged into um, the sustainability community. You've worked with different brands. Like, how do you think about, and I guess, I mean, I'm just thinking the community of people who would use your product, right? Like, how do you, what does commu the word community mean to you? Yeah. Um... With, with any movement, you need a lot of collaboration, I think, in order to succeed. So to me, community is collaboration. It's with, with a movement as massive as this benevolent materials revolution that I'm talking about, you need uh, the folks that are running major brands to be collaborating with the folks who are running waste infrastructure. And those folks need to be collaborating uh, with you know the average person to educate them about how they can participate in this new future that they're building. So I think it requires a lot of communication and then also yeah. a lot of tools that people can use to feel like they are a part of the movement. Um, and generally the go-to strategy that we like to use at Sway is that motivated people motivate other people. So when we talk about massive climate issues or when we talk about the plastic problem, we're not trying to focus on the doom and gloom and, and yeah. you know the, the inevitable destruction of the planet. We're talking about, look at all these incredible solutions, not just ours, but all the adjacent solutions that are happening in, in this space. And how can we all collaborate together to make those solutions a reality? And my favorite kinds of um, solutions are those that benefit every single section of the climate challenge because it's super intersectional. It's not just the environment, it's people, uh, it's business. Um, and, and a lot of the solutions can be super intersectional. So if, in our case, we see how the plastic problem feeds into cl the climate challenges. Climate challenges feed social inequity. Social inequity feeds the plastic problem. Um, we have the opportunity with seaweed to solve a bunch of those problems simultaneously because we're eliminating plastics and then through the cultivation of seaweed, we're sequestering carbon and mitigating ocean acidity. And then we're also delivering a material that not only provides employment, but enables the average person to be a conscious consumer. So when they're using this material, they can read this bag is, you know, sequestered X amount of carbon. At the end of its life, you can mix it with it in with your food scraps and it's gonna decompose into healthy soil. Like that's such a cool thing for the average person to experience because suddenly we've given them a tool to be a part of the bigger movement. It's it's super interesting to me because you think about normally, like I don't know what who made this, right? Like this piece of plastic, right? Like there's no there's no mission behind it, obviously. It serves like a utility, but it sounds like you're doing quite the opposite. You're like, hey, you should know about this, right? And I don't know, there's a supply chain that that does this, but your your approach is just super different. It, it seems like to me than like the industrial system that's like making most of the stuff we consume. Yeah, it's um, it's a question that we get a lot, which is, you know, packaging is such a commodity business. And yeah, no, I don't know who made this. Well, I, I do, but most people do not know who made this and nor do they care. And why would they? That it, you know, it's an inconvenience when you get it in a box, you know, a, a shipment from wherever. Um, so I think it's such a cool opportunity to bring people in and give them information. And, uh, you know, we're seeing calls for transparency and traceability 
within clothing, within food, and we're starting to see emerging um, systems for tracking the carbon footprint of a shoe, like that recent campaign we just saw from Adidas and Allbirds. That's super cool. That's yeah. a great example of collaboration, putting aside competition and saying, this is really important. People should be paying attention to it. Um, so I think, yeah, the, the opportunities are limitless, but when you give people information, they're more likely to trust you. And especially when we have so much, yeah, green, the, the pitfalls of greenwashing are so pervasive. So giving people the tools to say, here's the farmer who made your bag, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, something that you otherwise might not attribute value to changes the conversation. Yeah. I mean, I think it's the, this concept of uh, telling information sharing and to me, it's just like storytelling. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it comes from even, I mean, the, the purpose of this, right. Like I'm going to want to do this because I've heard, you know, hopefully because I've heard your story um, and not just because of, you know, Oh, great. She's yeah you know, charismatic and, and says this pitch, but like there's a, it's communicating kind of the reason behind it. I think is like yeah. super, super important. Um, what, so I guess like what makes you different, I guess, within your, industry, but also like, the, I guess, plastics, your competitors, but like other folks, you mentioned mushrooms, mm -hmm. kind of like other folks that are there tackling the space. No, I mean, so that's the great thing about it. And, and kind of when you mention community, it's all the biomaterial people are friends with each other. We all like each other. We're all rooting for each yeah. other to succeed. We talk to each other all the time. You know, how are you tackling this? How are you going to get over this hurdle? Um, yeah. So yeah, there is no silver bullet. There's a lot of solutions that need to be implemented. And that's the awesome thing about it is like we can create a regenerative future because there are all these solutions already just waiting to be implemented and adopted. Um, but there are other, you know, materials that are trying to compete with, with what we're building. And notably, those are the corn and sugar cane, cane based plastics that I was referring to earlier. PLA, it's like the most pervasive replacement. It's something like this is made from PLA and it's also, man, I don't know if we can say this on the air. You can say whatever you want. Say I'll say. tell you, Simon, this is like 40 to 80% petroleum based plastic. So that's wow. the problem and challenge in the packaging world is that this is labeled as compostable, but it can contain anywhere from 40 to 80% compostable petroleum based inputs. So the average person's going to say, wow, that's so cool. It's made from plants, but it's not really. Uh, I thought so you were going to first say some like raunchy story as opposed to provide. Like, <laughs> and then you will not believe. No. <laughs> like, can I say this? I was like, all right, what is he going to say? And well, I don't, I don't like to, to talk poorly about anyone, but yeah, that's some of what we're dealing with is a lot of misinformation. So when, you know, give, give the average person the tools to screen the materials that they interact face with just the way that you would screen your clothing, you know, you most likely don't want to be wearing synthetic materials. You want to avoid, uh, you know, virgin fibers. If you can work with recycled materials, that's way better. So there are like certain criteria that we can look at. And in the case of packaging, you want to choose materials that are 100% bio-based, 100% compostable. There's no such thing as partially compostable. It's either, it's like a, mm. I don't know, yes or Fire. no situation. Uh, and then you want to you want to be yeah working with materials that are ideally sourced from um, a renewable resource. So corn is like a monocrop that takes up a, a huge amount of space, and it is otherwise a food source. So if you can work with a novel material like seaweed or some of our competitors in the space derive their cellulose from trees, that's the best case scenario. What is your favorite type of seaweed? <laughs> Is it, There's this beautiful seaweed that you should look at. She's like, let me tell you about my favorite type of seaweed. <laughs> I should have a little picture. It's called Grinnell's Pink Leaf. And oh my God, that's my favorite. Yeah. Kind of seaweed. yeah. <laughs> it's so lovely. It's It looks like like a beautiful pink ribbon. And it's it's named Grinnell, which just sounds like a storybook. Maybe like I could get that as a gift for someone. Like for a, me? Like a, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll have to figure out where to get that. <laughs> Um, that is, that is amazing to, as we, as we kind of close it off here, like what's, what's next for, for Sway? Like you kind of alluded to some fundraising, some growing the team yeah, like on the horizon. Uh, yeah, we're wrapping up a pre-seed round right now. Really excited to share that news once it's all done and, and finished. And then we're racing towards pilots this year. So you're going to see Sway materials readily available by the beginning of next year. 
Um, we're building out the team, although I, I, I really love the team we've already built. We've got some superstars, really great attitude. Yeah. They all love the outdoors just as much as Matt and I do, which is awesome. Yeah. Uh, and we got some really cool brands that we're working with. So I'm excited to share that publicly too. Some really like-minded organizations that are saying, we hear the call for regeneration. We're ready to adopt a totally new material. We know that people want to see something new and refreshing and, you know, let's make it happen. So yes, this year is going to be a total roller coaster ride, but I'm, I'm super excited. Amazing. I am super excited for you i think like it's super challenging we talk it's funny you we we talk about work and then you call me and be like hey can we just talk about like this is hard right so yeah, part of it is, like, is everything is super hard so it's admirable uh it's funny i'm sitting here this is our first kind of test run but i use it as an excuse to record your story and hopefully <laughs> share it with as many people as as possible so thank you for talking a bit with with me and with the marco fam here about sway super excited for what you're doing i think it's really important but thank you so i'm happy to be here now you can call me anytime i know i will that's, that's, that's <laughs> you do that's actually it. so i know I really do. <laughs> anyways have a great rest of the week and uh catch everyone here on the next episode cheers cool.